three. Wait. Wait for it. Alfheimer, you're live. You are live. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, we're live now, apparently. Um, welcome, everyone, to um, the second week of the learning community. We are we're running a bit behind. We're really sorry. We had some unexpected tech issues. Um, these things happen. Even though we are, you know, we're not the stereotypical moms. We are very tech savvy, and we were ready. Um, the technology still let us down. <laughs> so, but you know, we're moms, and um, we we figure it out on the fly. So, thank you to to Julie, and thank you to Julie's husband for helping us get get going. We're sorry to keep you all waiting. Um, I'm very excited for this conversation. Um, I'm joined today by Wanga Zembe Mkabile. Um, and Wanga is a specialist scientist with the South African Medical Research Council. Welcome, Wanga. Thank you, Remy. Thank and, you, everyone. Um, I know, I know you, you said a little bit about who you are in the bio. You told us a little bit about um, your life as a mom. You're a busy mom. You've got two, 14 and five. Um, so you are like at both ends of the motherhood spectrum. Um, yes. But I thought I could start by by letting you tell us a little bit about about yourself um, and the work that you do um, and and how you came to do it. Okay, thank you so much, Rumi. I'm so privileged to be um, a part of this conversation today. Um, so yes, um, I'm a mother of two. Um, married, um, 38 years old, turning 39 this year. Um, <laughs> I, ori I live in Cape Town, um, but I originally come from the Eastern Cape, from the rural part of the former Transkei, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so I grew up in um, a, a small village there, and I came to Cape Town to study many years ago. And I never left, but I still, when I talk about going home, I, I, I'm still referring to the Eastern Cape. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm part of um, the people who do the annual exodus um, to the Eastern Cape every year. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah. my, my um, primary qualifications actually are, um, well, my primary qualification is um, um, I'm a social worker. Um, so that's how I started and at heart I've remained one. Um, but I think I entered the research That I do, um, the research that I do very much focuses on that and then specifically social assistance, which is how I keep my social work head on because I look at how, you know, social grants, do they work? Mm -hmm. How do they work um, for people? So I, I would mm -hmm. say in a nutshell, mm -hmm. that's, that's who I am in the work that I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about um, one of the the, the ways in which we came across you is you presented at the launch of the Child Gauge, um, and mm -hmm. you spoke about um, this long longitudinal research that you did over four years, was it, with 500, 500 women in low-income communities. Can you tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about that work and, and some of the findings um, that, some of the findings that have emerged from that work? Okay, um, yes, so four years ago, um, I, we ran a study that I led, um, which was a longitudinal 
started meaning it, it ran for um, more than a year. So it ran for four years where we recruited mothers in pregnancy, women in pregnancy, and um, mm -hmm. specifically at around five months, 20 weeks of pregnancy. And then we followed them up past delivery until their children turned two. And so, of course, because recruitment happens at different points, this is how it ends up being a four-year study. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. we were especially interested in seeing whether, the well, we wanted to know at which point do mothers apply for the child support grant? Mm -hmm. And if they do, do they get it? What are some of the issues with getting it? And then once they get it, what impact does it have Mm -hmm. on child um, health and, and well-being outcomes, but specifically child nutrition. So we wanted mm -hmm. to know, does it have an impact on how the children grow in terms of weight? Does it, does it have an impact on the height, how tall they mm -hmm. get? Mm -hmm. um, and then we also wanted to know, does it have an impact on food, household food security, dietary mm -hmm. patterns in the household, and so on. But in order to, because of the acknowledgement that child health and specifically child nutrition starts actually with maternal health. Um, this yeah. is why we recruited the mothers in pregnancy and mm -hmm. collected data on their own health status mm -hmm. and um, socioeconomic status in pregnancy and then um, followed um, them through. So that study ended last year actually just before the lockdown and then we extended mm -hmm. it by um, then following a, a small group of those women, about 20, to conducting now a qualitative study to find out how they were experiencing COVID. Mm. Um, mm. So the, the cohort, the result is, that's what we are analyzing now. It's a huge data set, yeah. as you can imagine. Yeah. So actually, mm -hmm. I, we don't know yet what, um, you know, what the story is in terms mm -hmm. of the outcomes we're looking at. But the mm -hmm. COVID data is what has... Um, you know, it's, it's what we've been able to analyze and, and, and get an understanding of now. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us a little bit about what, what has been the impact of COVID on those, on those lives, those 20 households that you went into in depth? Yeah. So, I mean, so these households were already, in fact, the entire 500. I mean, already, so we are looking at that, we're analyzing it now unemployment is overwhelmingly high. At least 70% mm -hmm. of the sample is unemployed, you know, so those caregivers are, are unemployed. So they mm -hmm. were already, you were already dealing with um, people who were living very precarious lives, mm -hmm. right on the mm -hmm. edge, frequent, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, you know, frequent food sh shortages. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, they are raising their, their children in crisis mode. That's, that's yeah. the context. That was yeah. the context before COVID mm -hmm. and what COVID did was something that I had not even seen in the 15 years that I've been doing this work what COVID mm -hmm. did to those families who were mm -hmm. already struggling where it was already very difficult um, and and essentially it because with pre-COVID a lot of these families um, and, and primary, uh, particularly the primary caregivers, they depended mm -hmm. on the child support grant as a primary mm -hmm. source of income, well, mm -hmm. as rather as a stable source of income, but they always mm -hmm. engaged, contrary to popular belief, that mm -hmm. low-income women, and mm -hmm. then particularly mothers, that they're lazy, they don't want to work, contrary mm -hmm. to that, just about all of these women engage, before COVID, would engage in some form of income mm -hmm. generation whether i mean very casual and informal of course whether mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. um, doing someone's washing whether mm -hmm. that's um selling um some you know having a little veggie stall that makes 20 rand a day whether mm -hmm. that's um doing what they call um char work you know being a domestic worker for two days a week they're mm -hmm. engaging in different strategies to make that to support to complement to supplement that mm -hmm. little 460 rand Mm -hmm. And what COVID did was to do away with all of that. Yeah. yeah. But t and, and that started with those first three to four months of lockdown, which were particularly hard mm -hmm. because suddenly they couldn't do any of those activities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, borrowing debt, credit is mm. crucial in, in, um, in, 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 in the lives of low income people in general, not just mm -hmm. primary, you know, not just mothers. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, that's how they get through. So, for instance, 
um, primary caregivers who receive the child support grant in general, and that's supported by data out there. They run out of food about halfway through the month to the last week. And so mm -hmm. the only way they would usually cope with that is to borrow. Do to some borrow, borrowing, to whether cover that's, the gap. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm. And that includes, and, and mainly that's borrowing food, you know, from a mm. other shop or from, um, and they butter, they, they swap, they exchange. Mm. Um, mm. And so COVID, because, especially hard lockdown, because mm. they said mm. you can't leave your house, it mm -hmm. meant they couldn't, mm -hmm. they couldn't turn to those usual sources of, of help. And that mm. had an impact. And then mm. the hard lockdown also meant children were at home. They couldn't go to school. Exactly. And so they're not getting, home. yeah. So all of the supplemental meals that they may be getting, yeah. school, feeding schemes, yeah. all of it gone away. Yeah. All yeah. of it gone away. And on top sure. of that, they can't go and play in the street, which somehow will, you know, pile away time. They have mm -hmm. to be inside. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of them are talking about how, they want food or at a time when there's absolutely no food. This is when they want food more than, mm -hmm. any, you know, more than ever. They want food all the time. They want to eat. And in fact, as I did these interviews, I would mm -hmm. hear, because I did them telephonically, you know, starting um, from the hard lockdown, I would mm -hmm. hear these children crying and, 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 and one mother would say what he said, actually, she said, they're clutching my skirts right now. They want food. Sure. Um, so just harrowing, sure. unbelievable. Um, just, mm. you know, in the 15 years I've been doing this work, there would always be, mm. you know, when mm. someone would say there's no food, they would often mean that there's the staple, the mealy meal to make pap is mm. there. Mm. There's some rice. But maybe there's no, maybe there's there's no nothing meat. to go with it. Maybe there's no, or, yes, or exactly. veggies. There are no veggies. Exactly. There's nothing to make it more edible. You know, so for mm. instance, they would eat pap with tea, but the tea would have mm. sugar, which makes it a mm. bit more edible. So that's still pretty desperate. But with COVID, they went from that desperate situation to there's nothing. There is nothing. To literal nothing. nothing. Yeah. Yes. And there's nowhere to turn to. You can't, you can't go and borrow. You can't say you're going to go wash someone's, you know, do someone's laundry for them. Mm. You can't, mm. there's just nothing to be done. So I think mm. the palpable mm. sense of desperation and utter destitution, that's what came through in those, in those interviews. Yeah. And I, I mean, Wanga, you've touched on this um, because you say, uh, you know, as you say, some of your work, and I did post on the group in the learning guide that uh, your work focuses on, um, on, on social grants and the role that social grants play in alleviating, like some of the, you say these families are families in a precarious situation and mm -hmm. the social grants can kind of be somewhat of a stopgap. Um, mm -hmm. And, and one of the things we've noticed in our conversations, I mean, it's a, it's a conversation, it's a trope in conversations that we have about, not just about mothers, but about poor people. You know, everyone talks about the child support grant as being this somehow this like incentive, like, oh, then people will just get pregnant because the child mm -hmm. support grant is available. Um, we know that's a myth <laughs> in the mm -hmm. work that we do. Why do you think this yeah. myth is so persistent and just will not go away not just amongst um and it's not just amongst kind of you know middle classes it's yeah it's, mm, yeah it, it's often kind of held commonly even within communities where people are really struggling um and you can see yeah. what the grant is for why does this myth persist yeah i mean so it's interesting about social assistance this has been written about widely and that's it's all over the world that's the incredible thing about it if you mm -hmm. go to Europe, you go, to, I mean, the U.S. is most famous for coining the wealthy, the wealthy queen. Queen, a term, mm -hmm. exactly, mm -hmm. um, in the U.K. Um, and, and even in, in, in parts of, of Europe, especially now in these days, that have mm -hmm. been fairly mm -hmm. progressive and, and you, know, um, you know, underlined by values of social democracy, you see mm -hmm. that um, these perceptions are held. Mm -hmm. And... I've studied myself, I've tried to study them from the point of um, the poor themselves, low-income communities, why do they think of, and not just low-income people, CSG recipients, the primary caregivers who receive the child support grant, what mm -hmm. they say is, mm -hmm. I use it well, but others don't. <laughs> and it's only if you press and say, do you personally know someone who doesn't? 
then mm. they're like no but i often hear that they you know that many of these recipients they um, who get this money they drink and they use it on hair and so i think in part it's because of just the the hostile um context in which state assistance is given in in the world and mm. including in this country that as human beings mm. we and of course the framing of this of the narrative uh, you know started a long time ago and ideas travel right so yes yeah. from the beginning when 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 poverty was seen as personal failure which is it is it's an ideological view there are people who see yeah. poverty that you are poor because you've just not done enough so it starts there you're not working hard enough yes it's, yeah you're, you're not bad working hard enough now. you're not serious yeah. you're not doing mm. enough you, mm. you've not taken up the opportunities mm. that represented you and even in this country with the history that we have there are people strongly <laughs> believe that yeah right yeah. which is yeah. so it mm-hmm. starts there mm. it's, it's, it's seeing poverty as personal failure and then and then from then on you know so if someone is in the situation they're in because of their own fault why should government have why should we think that if they get any kind of size, they're going to be responsible. It's already mm. their irresponsibility that has put them in this place where they are poor. Yes. Yeah. And then yeah. you factor in just the way in which women are viewed the world over, mm. including in this context, you know, in a patriarchal yeah. context that views women as, um, you know, very differently. So mm. then you, 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 you put money in the hands of those women and it's like, oh, they just, you know, it's never going to mm. work. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. for poor people in particular, and this has been um, uh, uh, confirmed in my own studies, um, they try to, they hear the narrative, they know what is being said out there about so, um, recipients of social assistance and, and particularly of the child support grant. And so they try to immediately say, well, that may be true, but I'm not, it's, I'm not the one that's doing that. I'm not part of the group that does that. Mm-hmm. And so in, in, a, mm-hmm. in a very strange kind of mm-hmm. way, they think that, they think they shouldn't disown the narrative completely, but they should simply focus on saying, I don't do it. I'm the exception. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's yeah. like, in, you know, with race, racial stereotypes where people think, well, I'm not going to say black people are not lazy, but I'm just going to make sure that you understand that I'm not. <laughs> I'm different. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm different. Yeah. So it's, it's about, yeah. it's just a very strange, um, and, and I'm, mm. I'm I'm always surprised about how enduring it is as a belief. It just doesn't go away. It doesn't go away, no matter how many times it's been debunked. Yeah. 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 Evidence shows that it's not true. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things we noticed, um, I think I was talking about it with Julie, um, that the, I think it's uh, Sasa, Sasa's launched an online platform where you can register now um, for assistance online. Um, which is obviously fantastic. Um, and here's hoping that it means that people aren't having to stand in queues for all of these long, long periods. And maybe it'll make the process just a little bit more efficient for some. But even yeah. on that website, I went onto the website and it says the right, it, the language is something like the right grant, the right assistance for the right people at the right time in the right mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. It's like right yes, four indeed. times. It's like, okay. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like the, the emphasis on like yeah. the emphasis on use this well, use this well, use mm-hmm. this well. Mm-hmm. Um, and it actually links to um, my next question for you, which is around the maternity support grant. Mm-hmm. So um, Embrace was a part of the community care project last year, which was um, the result of relief funding from um, the German Development Bank. And that relief funding was then used to distribute food, vou- well, not food vouchers, they were vouchers in general mm-hmm. in communities across across Cape Town. Um, mm-hmm. and, and the idea was that people would then use those vouchers within their own communities um, at spaza shops. So the, mm-hmm. trying to build this kind of circular economy where the money is staying yeah. in that community. Mm-hmm. Um, and and we, were, we were adamant about this idea of the the voucher being for for what you wanted it to be because we <laughs> are of the opinion that I don't know what's going on in your household better than you do, right? You know what's going <laughs> on in your household and you know what that 300 rand or that 600 rand over the period of four weeks is going to do. Um, you know, if it's to buy nappies, 
um, or like if it's to buy samp, um, if it's to mm-hmm. buy maybe not even maybe the sanitary pads that you need in mm-hmm. your household. Mm-hmm. You know, mothers mm-hmm. are living in those households and should be able to make those decisions. Um, mm-hmm. And so I want to hear more about what your thoughts are on this idea of a maternity support grant that then extends, acknowledges that mothers need the support well before the child is even here, mm-hmm. right? That mm-hmm. the first 1,000 days starts at conception um, mm-hmm. and that the health of a child is, is kind of starting to take shape even before that child has emerged from the womb. Um, mm-hmm. and so that assistance needs to begin much earlier. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your thoughts on that um, and how you think it could work in South Africa? Could, could an MSG work here? Yeah. In, in fact, um, uh, Rumbi, it's been considered for, yeah, you know, at least the last 12 years, um, mm-hmm. uh, in, even in government, you know, um, mm-hmm. there's been consideration, it's been a, a, a policy reform that's been um, considered um, at various points. And even at those, at, at, at certainly at one point, there was political, with clear political will to, to, do, to do it. I think what's made um, the cold care um, study very important is that it brings evidence which we've not had before on the pregnancy mm-hmm. front. Um, mm-hmm. Because, and, and that's really lack of funding. I remember there was a time mm-hmm. when we, um, you know, I was asked to collaborate on a proposal with with, with someone who really um, wanted to to run a study of this nature, but of course it's expensive, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So I think yeah. um, I think it's it's that's what's great about it because of course um, government and and even taxpayers become convinced. You know, evidence can be used to convince and 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 um, and challenge and um, and advocate for for a, a program so i'm in full support of course it's, it's so needed mm-hmm. um and, and and not only because concept you know child health and, and especially specifically child nutrition starts um at conception in, in fact before conception but certainly at conception mm-hmm. is very important um mm-hmm. but also for for the health of the mother herself for her own mm-hmm. sake um, I mean, I think at, at pregnancy is a time of vulnerability. Um, you know, your body is doing these miraculous things. Mm-hmm. And so to have to do it in a context of deprivation and hunger is just yeah. really, um, mm-hmm. it's a travesty. It, it, it's, it's, um, it's immoral. It's, it's mm-hmm. wrong. It's every bad word you can think of. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, very recently I did a... Um, I did a, I was doing some interviews as part of a study that was looking at TB, but um, I encountered a young woman who is TB um, who was actually pregnant. She, she was around mm-hmm. in, in her mid twenties. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a, she, she was so underweight that I met oh, her man. on a Thursday and I thought she was five months pregnant, but she was actually giving birth on that Monday, that that was her due date. Oh my gosh. So four days, she was four days away from giving birth. But light as a feather, you could blow her away, you know, just blowing on her, mm. she, she, could, she would fall. And mm. um, it was a very, very difficult interview. She had tears in her eyes for most of the interview. And what she was saying mm. was, in pregnancy, I've been feeding this child hunger, my hunger. And when she says, mm. Miss Kosa, mm-hmm. mm. she was eating my hunger, the, the child mm. inside has been eating my hunger all the time. Mm. has been eating my nothingness right all this time so she said how much more when when he or she is born what's going to happen mm. um mm. and and it was um i still get very um um touched when i talk because it was just such a horrible no human being especially not in that condition should go through that first of all but also have such thoughts and i remember thinking at that point gosh, if this pregnancy grant was around, mm. you know, so even if it wasn't, because this was someone mm-hmm. who was unemployed, her partner is unemployed, there's no money coming in, literally every single day, how she mm. eats is just the grace of God, it's whatever she happens to eat on that day, and she goes for days mm. without eating, pregnant, mm. and she's about to bring a child into that situation, so I think mm. there's more than enough um, 
evidence and justification for it. And in fact, mm -hmm. um, it's a great pity um, that we've not had it. How is it that we in 2021 and this form of support is still not available still to not, yeah. this mm -hmm. country? And mm -hmm. in, to go to your mm -hmm. question on whether, you know, it, can it be done? How would it be done? We have a functioning, well-developed, advanced, not even by developing country standards, just mm -hmm. advanced period, welfare system that's been in we place do. since do. the pre-war period. Yes, mm -hmm. it, so when it was segregated by race, you know, access to it was segregated. But this is why we have a very strong social assistance, social welfare system that's in place that mm -hmm. can implement a, a, a grant of, of this kind. And of course, mm -hmm. in terms of fiscal space, it's, you make choices, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's based on, you decide what's important. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And you, you also then decide what is the cost? Because if in South Africa right now, our stunting rate, which has not moved, hardly shifted in the mm -hmm. over 25 years of democracy, we, it's not mm -hmm. shifted much mm -hmm. at 27%, you know, of children stunted. So if, you, if you're not, which, which for a, a country like ours, I an mean, upper middle income country, it's, it's absolutely shocking that we mm -hmm. have such high rates of, of stunting. And stunting mm -hmm. is an indicator of chronic poverty. Those are children mm -hmm. who are growing up in a chronic in state hunger. of deprivation and hunger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. I don't think it's a choice. It's, it's even something that should be deliberated. Mm -hmm. I think it's mm -hmm. great that there's evidence to back it up, but really it's intuitive in this country. Mm -hmm. It should be. Mm -hmm. Um, and that really it's, an, it's an issue of social justice, really. It's completely an issue of, of social mm -hmm. justice. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think the fact that there have been moments when there's been serious consideration. I mean, I, I attended a meeting um, uh, 2017, yes, because my five-year-old was one and I took him with. <laughs> yeah. I remember it very well. <laughs> Fun. Invited, <laughs> invited by the DSC to, to come and make... Um, you know, to comment on a number of reforms that they were planning, of which the the pregnancy grant was one of them. Mm. And then things changed, and you know, I, I mean, I'm hopeful now, and I think the call care project very much indicates that it's it's probably coming back on on the scene. And and COVID mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, has provided us, um, uh, you know, such a time. It's been tragic, but it also presented us opportunities that we didn't have before. Yeah. yeah. Especially to see what happens if you do not have a, a country that has measures in place. And South Africa is do, you know, mm -hmm. has done it a lot, but a lot more could be done. And COVID has shown us what happens if you do not have a comprehensive social security system that mm -hmm. takes care of, of the vulnerable. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think, I think one of the things that COVID definitely illustrated is what's possible um mm -hmm. the coke project got going it was a multi-stakeholder effort um mm -hmm. at like provincial government level the provincial departments of health were involved um you know clinics were involved um and and it got going and it was up and off the ground and everyone was registered within six weeks thousands mm -hmm. of thousands of people tens of thousands of people registered so i mean you know and and in six weeks we were able to do that so it it shows wow. what's possible um when there is urgency and actually that the, the urgency actually exists mm -hmm. whether there's a pandemic or not right yes um we have we have some questions um i'm gonna i'm gonna start with this one because it, it speaks to what we we're just saying so this is from um, Mora Letualo. Mora says, ladies, can we please be realistic? I went to SASA offices today and the issue of online registration is not yet implemented. Moreover, their web page is full of outdated information. Our state of public offices sometimes leave much to be desired, I must say. To say they are trying is not good enough. How long have we been in democracy? Freedom that came with a lot of pain for all who live in this country. Motherhood can be very painful. Um, not for the uh, faint-hearted. My concern is in this country, there's too much talk and less doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is a difficult one for, for a number of reasons, right? I can hear the frustration and I can hear the pain, Mora. And, and when we spoke before this um, a few days ago, 
Wanga, you were, we were speaking about the, the difficulty and the frustration of engaging with these realities in the work that you do and meeting yeah. others and, and seeing what's happening and, and wondering when you write that up and, and you turn it into, say, a policy recommendation, you know, wondering how you can make it be, be more than just the words, how you can make it travel and, and mm-hmm. make a difference that maybe reaches that young mother who, who was starving and, and almost, you know, 40 weeks pregnant. Mm-hmm. Yes, indeed. I mean, I think so. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's hard not to agree with um, with with Mara. Mm. It's um, it's although again, COVID showed us the very sasa situation that we're talking about. Mm. The COVID nineteen grant was mostly applied for in you know digitally. Very few mm. people had to physically because they couldn't because COVID discouraged people gathering. So Sasa mm-hmm. had to figure out a way for people to apply, mm. you, you know, and that was littered with its own, you know, million problems, mm. um, which which delayed access to that grant in the first place. But that was mm-hmm. precisely because we weren't prepared as a country. We didn't have a system that was prepared for mm. something like this. But I think lessons have been learned from that. I think. Electronic registration and application will probably take a while, but if there's intention, I think that's that gives me hope. Um, mm-hmm. And I think in terms of then somehow finding a way, advocating for change, it's very difficult. And it doesn't just take, as I've learned <laughs> rather bitterly, it does mm-hmm. not just take you know research, it doesn't take the thing that I'm doing myself, you know, no matter how emotive the the stories, the quotes that I use, um, mm. no matter how powerful and um, heartbreaking, you mm. know, the data that you share, it, the wheels of change will still turn so, or might not turn at all. So it needs it needs to be approached from 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 different angles. It needs. Um, what I mentioned the other day when we what we talked about cross class coalitions, it needs much more than just you know relying on um, academics or, or or practitioners who have the ear of you know policymakers through, for instance, writing up briefs and um, and Research. reports. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. because I feel in some ways the government becomes numb to that sort of information. They used to it, they get tons of it all the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so what, but what is needed, which is what I've started to do now with my work, is to partner up with advocacy education, um, or rather organizations, um, you know, who are experienced in pushing messages and, and not just as, as organizations, but on behalf of, with the people behind them. And it mm-hmm. needs, a, you know, a groundswell of ordinary people, you know, standing up and saying, this is what we demand. And where cross-class coalitions become powerful is that you have the middle class, upper and middle classes, specifically the pay- taxpayers, you have them joining mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the poor in their struggle and saying with one voice, this is what we demand for our country. Mm-hmm is what we will not accept so Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the absence of there's it's completely absent in this country right in fact so yes the researchers Mm -hmm. even the people Mm -hmm. who run organizations are themselves middle class but you don't have ordinary south africans even knowing about this stuff you know so a lot of the work that i do when people hear about it even at work right they're like what they're just completely shocked. It's so far removed. Yeah. And it's a country wow. that has yeah. geographically segregated people, separated people, like here in Cape Town, so that they are hidden. Poverty is hidden, depending on where you stay in Cape Town. You may never ever see it. You may only see a mm. poor person if they come to clean your house. You don't ever need to engage with them. Mm. You don't ever need to engage with their context. So if those taxpayers don't know what's happening, and I and I I believe firmly that. We have a lot of decent people, citizens in this country who would care if they knew. And this is why participating in mm-hmm. this talk, oh dear, 
<laughs> it's it's motherhood. There's always there's always a little guest star. Hello, hello, Hello. Hi. No, I, I hear you. Um, I'm gonna read another. Uh, there's a question here. Um, which I guess is just speaking to what we were talking about earlier is how can people think that poverty is an indication of not doing enough? This country is still struggling to close the gaps of inequality. I am educated with a wealth of experience, but difficult to be permanently employed. I live the life of a hustler for a long time now. And I think mm -hmm. this is something that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, I think COVID showed us like the nature of work, the world of work and the way that we look at work is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, this idea that you become a salaried employee and you work at a particular place 10, 20 years, you get the watch and the pension and that's that, right? It's, it's the economy can't sustain that anymore. Um, and a lot of people are, like you were saying, like even the mothers who are receiving the grants, they're piecing together work um, mm -hmm. to, to, to get by. Um, and I thought that, you know what, that was one of the lessons of COVID. And I, you, would have, you would think that people would come out of it with a better kind of understanding of, yeah, like the lack of social protections um, for people that we, we assume that you are only, like you're only um, entitled to like maternity leave. You're only entitled to a pension fund. You're only entitled to all these benefits if you have that permanent contract. And that like a mm -hmm. permanent contract is a very difficult thing to come by. It was difficult before COVID. It's even yeah. harder now. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, is, is, there, is there any of that in, in the work that you're finding? Are you finding, are, are people still coming up against this idea that the only work that, that matters and the only work that's productive is that kind of the permanent steady, you know, rather than kind of, trying to figure out how we can protect and better serve people who are doing bits and pieces of contract work. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, exactly. So that's, that's, and the thinking around how, well, you know, um, those protections mm -hmm. only come with permanent work and with these great benefits and permanent mm -hmm. work is usually also, especially one that um, has, such benefits attached to it, it's usually, you know, for highly qualified, you know, mm -hmm. educate, at least professionals, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so even as that, you know, becomes the sort of how people think about it, but the reality is there is no, even in, in professional organizations and institutions, there are no permanent contracts. It's impossible mm -hmm. to get one, nearly, mm -hmm. um, right? And so I think this is why if you consider what, countries that have adopted a welfare state model where the state puts mm. in place measures to take care of citizens from birth, you know, from um, cradle to the grave, as they say, mm. you know, so, and so those measures are put in place to ensure that if anyone, regardless of their status, regardless of their, the type of employment, whatever they are doing, whatever their, their, um, uh, um, you know, their life's work is or, or, or not, that they will be assured the basic minimum, mm -hmm. you know, of, of benefits mm -hmm. that will help them live a decent life. Mm -hmm. um, part of a, another project that I'm involved in um, looks at um, this notion of um, a decent standard of living, which is what we're mm -hmm. calling for through that work in this country, that there needs to be a decent, and a decent standard of living is underlined by these basic measures which are not minimalist but mm. measures mm. and benefits that are in place to ensure mm. that even if you are unemployed even if you are employed in the informal economy but your basic needs will be met if you're pregnant you're going to be taken care of if you mm -hmm. are sick mm -hmm. you're going to i mean this the data from these covid interviews uh, i mean mm -hmm. if mm. you try to think about how the poor have tried to access health care which is has always been difficult pre-covid during covid it's a, it's, it's it's disastrous, mm -hmm. you know, so that, mm -hmm. that if you're sick, you're going to be able to, to that if you're hungry, you will have decent, nutritious food, that if, mm -hmm. you, if, mm -hmm. if you're homeless, you will have shelter. In fact, that mm -hmm. you will not get to a point of homelessness. So those are basic measures. Yeah. And they are done by 
through tax revenue. So it's taxpayers. It's the will of the mm -hmm. people. The people have mm -hmm. to be willing to do that, to create mm -hmm. such a world. Mm -hmm. And in countries mm -hmm. where such worlds exist, such as mm -hmm. in Sweden, those are the, the choices. And Sweden made that, mm -hmm. that contract, that, 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 you know, that social contract between mm -hmm. the citizens and the government before it became a wealthy mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah. so I'm very much for that, that mm -hmm. if as a country, and it, it will take, I mean, you know, so even the middle class here is a small proportion to, compared to the, the poor, but yeah. the earnings and, 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 and the, the, the value that's held in that small group of people, mm -hmm. relatively mm -hmm. speaking, mm -hmm. is, would be enough to provide this mm -hmm. basic protection. You know, mm -hmm. so it, it will take ordinary South Africans coming together and saying, mm -hmm. this is what we will not accept to, you know, mm -hmm. having pregnant mothers going hungry. We will not mm -hmm. accept mm -hmm. people. So the, the, the person who's just posted that question, yes, you know, we must all hustle. People must hustle, but they must hustle with, with their basic needs with, met, though. Mm -hmm. With a safety net, yeah. With a safety there's net. A comment, there's a comment that's come through from um, Maggie. Maggie is one of our Mamandla fellows. And, and Maggie says, I get that the whole goal of this learning community is to empower the group to take action, the Embrace Learning Community, but this is heartbreaking and devastating information. It just makes me feel so incredibly hopeless and helpless. Um, and I, I hear that, I do. Mm. I do think though that, that what you're saying about, you know, because in addition to the, like, the conversations that we all get stuck in around social assistance and grants and blah, 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 I do hear a lot of people talking about in this country, lots of people talking about how they pay rates and they are taxpayers and blah, blah, blah. And if we could take some of that energy and channel it into lobbying, I mean, it is it is absolutely, mm. for me, I feel, I felt a deep sense, I mean, that helplessness and hopelessness and just that like muted rage of mm -hmm. like I sitting and watching um, the budget speech. I watched the, I watched the speech because we were watching it for work, sitting there and watching the speech. And just the way in which the minister spoke about the way in which he spoke about the the minimal increase to social mm. assistance, the way in which he spoke about, I think he said something like, "We we live in a society where people think they can just get." And, and a part of me is like mm. this rage of like, I, I you know what I mean? I, mm. I I'm contributing to that pot of money. I'm a taxpayer. You can't mm. talk about fellow citizens that way that's mm -hmm. not okay um yeah. you 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 can't tell me that you're putting a 10 rand increase on this grant mm -hmm. in, given the year that people have just lived through and expect that to be okay i want to see the line items and maybe that's part of it is taking our energy um and we tried to do that embrace tried to do that this year with the budget is mm -hmm. listen to the budget these are the things we're asking you know what is happening with the COVID relief grants? Are they just going to be taken away? Um, are we increasing um, the, the child support grant? Is there provision mm -hmm. for a basic income grant that we've been talking mm -hmm. about well for a long time? Maternity support grant, none of that was mentioned. None mm. of that was mentioned. Nothing about stunting, which as you say mm -hmm. is, is ridiculous. I mean, we have really high rates of stunting in this country relatively. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe it's about taking that rage and, and saying that, like that, I'm not okay as a taxpayer. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, I, I, I always resist the language of taxpayers because I think it is very much, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to be like, it feels like madam speak for me. I'm like, I don't want to be like, and, and very othering. Like, yeah. I pay my taxes. Yeah. You know, we all pay taxes. There's VAT mm. in this country. Everyone is paying taxes, whether or not we're. Yes, through VAT even. <laughs> exactly. You know, we're paying taxes. But yeah. maybe that's what we say is like, I'm paying 15 yeah you know on everything i buy in this country mm -hmm. um even though some things are zero rated not everything is um let's talk mm -hmm. about that like what you know yeah, yeah. i mean i uh, yeah i'm gonna go to more questions because the, the questions are coming in um we have a, a comment here from um, bongi hill who says um this is exactly why we're here to learn wanga we want to know so we can be activists for all mothers these stories must be amplified. I mean, I, I think that as well, this idea that like you have to, the stories are difficult, but once once we start to look away or once we start to mm -hmm. let people look away, 
um, then we let them get away with, with, you know, these broad generalizations about falling pregnant for a grant. Mm -hmm. um, so Wanga, you know, I, I, we've read and I shared in the group um, the piece that you wrote in the conversation and your Daily Maverick article. What are the, what are some of the other ways in which you amplify these stories, these, these very heartbreaking stories that you're coming into contact with? Um, yeah, what's, how? <laughs> yeah, well, um, I mean, I think the sort of um, ways in which we do it um, as an organization and, and, and personally, even as myself, which kind of fo follows those formal ways, writing op-eds um, such as the ones you've mentioned, I've done a couple of radio interviews, TV interviews, mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, but lately what I uh, was mentioning before that partnering up with an advocacy I've recently done, and then I'm also doing more work now with the Black Sash, which are a very important organization in terms of mm -hmm. just how much they, and I mean, they get results, hey, they mm -hmm. do, mm -hmm. uh, maybe not immediately, but they are a force to be reckoned with. Um, and mm -hmm. the Black Sash is an organization that existed during, um, apartheid so they come mm. with those struggle credentials and experience of pushing back um and mm -hmm. so and they have experience in building campaigns um mm. you know and 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 creating uh, uh, uh credit and they've formed relationships partnerships with with um with the government so um mm -hmm. but i think ultimately it is going to take a critical mass of ordinary South Africans, I keep saying, um, mm. partnering with, you know, people generating the evidence, um, you know, uh, movements such as Embrace, so movements that mm -hmm. draw on those people and those movements coming together with other movements, you know, so it can't mm -hmm. be the work of a single organization or a single person or um, a group of people who, who are um, operating in a certain way, for instance, a group of research, it's not going to take that. It's going to take coming at it yeah. from different angles. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the pure outrage that many of us, as you said, had about the budget speech. Yeah. Just unbelievable, right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so something, and, and I mean, look, you know, many of us signed, um, you know, petitions immediately, the Black Search, you know, that were written, mm -hmm. submitted yes. to government saying this is unacceptable. Yeah. Mm. Um, and I think it contributed the the work that embraced it. Um, it contributed to to the COVID because the COVID nineteen grant was supposed to stop in January. Mm -hmm. It contributed to government saying, "Well, we'll continue it in in April." Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. again, and I think government can easily um, rely on the negative narrative that exists about. Mm -hmm poor mothers France. in this country, you know, yeah. because for instance, we equally advocated for the caregivers grant, the, the mm. 500 rand top up, yes, that, yes, that, yes. which ended in October. Mm. And the stories that I've heard from recipients who lost the huge difference, it wasn't a lot of money, the enormous mm. difference it made, day and night difference mm. it mm. made to those households. And it ended in October. And, mm -hmm. But it took something, a grant like the COVID-19 grant, which is about unemployment, but it excludes mothers. And, I've, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a research study that we did with um, Black Sash, the one mother said, it's as if we're being punished for being mothers. Yeah. Because we're not, now this grant has ended. Mm -hmm. Why are we not allowed to apply for this other one? Are we being punished for bringing children into this world? Mm -hmm. You know, so I think mm -hmm. it also means that, it, it also means that we have to tackle um, ideological views, the way in which people's worldviews, how they view, and not just people, decision makers, you know, so the way yes. in which the, the minister spoke, what you're referring to, so we have to do that as well, um, change the, the wider narrative about women, first of all, and then particularly mothers, mm. um, and that only happens, you know, norms in society are changed through conversations through media through using multiple tools to, mm -hmm. to where people say something different to what you are hearing every day 
Mm-hmm. So I think, mm-hmm. you know, and, and those views have to be challenged and um, mm-hmm. people have to be challenged. And, but also it means that people who are employed in positions of power and decision makers, we have to also look at that. What kind of people are we putting in those spaces? Because they come with their own ideological views. They come with their own um, way of seeing the world and that impact on how then, because in fact, when I refer to textile, I'm not saying necessarily that we should be p- paying more. I'm saying we can put mm-hmm. pressure to ensure that what is already there is mm-hmm. used in a way that we, the people, agree with. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I, I like the, this idea that you know the taxes are not. It's not a mark of that I'm better than anyone else. It's not a mark, but it it's what I contribute to. And I mean, I maybe it's naive, but um, the revenue service used to have some years ago. They used to have those those very kind of like stirring adverts. Thank you, South Africa. This is what you did. Mm-hmm. Blah, blah. Um, and I, I felt proud. This is what we did. And so now it's kind of like, okay, <laughs> um, yeah, we're we doing now. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But I, I am. Oh, so there's a question from. Um, it's a follow on from from kind of the, this idea of amplifying the stories and and having the conversations as how do we amplify these stories with dignity and when when Jules and I spoke to you earlier in the week um you spoke about you've got a PhD um and so you're a senior researcher but that you are committed to doing the primary data collection yourself so you're not mm-hmm. sending interns to interview to interview people and that I think is speaks to that idea of of people's dignity could you say a little bit about that explain to the audience what that decision is about for you yes um so I think I mean it's easier for me to make that decision because I speak the language I um in a sense I I'm able to identify with and have those communities identify with me easier Mm-hmm. Um, but I think dignity in how um, not just research participants, but how people from all low income settings are treated is extremely important to me. Mm-hmm. Um, in my other work, um, I'm involved in a project on decolonizing research methods where mm-hmm. we, we think about, because in fact, the way in which even research as most work, you know, mm-hmm. um, is done in this country and elsewhere. It doesn't, it comes from, and particularly research, people are, you know, all terms that used to be used to describe participants are subjects. So it's very mm. detached. It depersonalizes mm. people. Um, and so decolonizing research methods is about undoing that and reversing it. And part of that is upholding the dignity of, um, of participants and, and, Personally, I do that not only by being the one that goes there, but I take, um, I mean, I have to be, I acknowledge that I'm in an outside, you know, I'm an inside outsider, as I like to call myself. I'm an insider in that, you know, I talk to people where they see someone who looks like them, who speaks like them, who, mm-hmm. and often I always start off by talking about how I come from the Eastern Cape and that in, builds immediate mm-hmm. rapport, immediate mm-hmm. connection. Mm-hmm. Um, and I will... Um, introduce myself. Uh, I mean, I'll say my name, but I'll introduce myself by my clan name because that's how Kosa people, you know, um, in Guazul Natal, I'll, I'll do it differently because they, they don't use clan names as such. So it's being sensitive to how communities perceive respect, how they understand, mm-hmm. um, you know, how if, when a person treats them with respect and it's breaking down the, 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 barriers um, that are created by the sense that I never mention my, my, my profession or my qualifications or, or I, I simply come in as someone, I say, I come from this institution and this is what we're trying to do. Um, so to try and break down those barriers, but above all, the, the, I, I insist on, on the person knowing from the beginning and throughout the interview that they shouldn't tell me anything they're not comfortable disclosing that their identity will be protected at all costs. Um, so I never ever, you know, and I've, I've had requests for these, the mothers to come and do videos. And I'm like, no, 
Mm-hmm. Um, I want, <laughs> and, and the danger mm-hmm. of it is because p- people from low, in, low income settings are very are used to being exploited and to being told what to do. They they are used to those power dynamics where yeah. where they are and where also they think, well, I should just say yes. So it's dangerous mm-hmm. to say, well, I'll ask if they will they want to be in the video because they're likely to say yes, even though they don't mm-hmm. really want to and or they don't fully mm-hmm. understand what mm-hmm. it means. Next thing their face is on the the thing and I don't think you know I mean people use different methods but I'm very mindful of mm. um and what's come through in my 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 research and others as well the the, the, the shame that comes with poverty so people mm-hmm. like to think that oh poor people are so happy and so they certainly have dignity but there's a lot mm-hmm. of poverty is humiliating that's just a mm-hmm. fact Mm -hmm. You know, so a person will have their own dignity and pride in who they are as a person, but the context they're having to live out their lives in is humiliating and shameful. And that's a fact, you know, so, so, I mean, yeah, I've had to say no to a lot of things, people who want to do observational stuff where they observe how, and I'm like, that's not right. So I think, but it takes a lot of mindfulness and a lot of, um, and I've made mistakes, right? And and you learn from those. Mm-hmm. Um, and you constantly acknowledge that, in my case, I'm an insider, but I'm an outsider purely because of the position I hold now in society and that I don't mm-hmm. live mm-hmm. there. You know, although when I go mm-hmm. back home in the Eastern Cape, then I do. You know? yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's how I would answer that question. Mm. That's a fantastic answer. That's a really... I think it's a really wonderful and a very human approach to research um, and not just research, just to people's pain. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have about five minutes to go. Um, I'm just kind of reading through these comments and seeing if there's anything that we haven't discussed. Um, Oh, here's one. Um, Yeah. Around, around accessing the grant. And I guess this is, it kind of takes us back a little bit, but um, yeah, I mean, I I think there's a kind of a lot of, there's a sense of kind of confusion about grants in that they are, they're accessible, but that they aren't always easy to access the red tape of actually getting there. And so um, one of the things, I think research that was kind of done a while ago that was debunking this myth that, that particularly that young teen mothers are getting pregnant to access the grant was that actually they're the ones who need it the most and they're the ones who access it the least. Um, So has that come up in your work? Like some of the logistical barriers to accessing grants, um, just like registering for them. Yes. Yes. I mean, our take up rates have improved hugely. So we are at about 80% now, but if you think about the 20%, it's a Mm -hmm. big number. Mm. you know mm. um it's not negligible at all if you think mm. about the actual mm. 20 and you think of the need behind it and a lot of the barriers are still administrative so mm. and particularly for young mothers because mm. of uh, the fact that they are still um you know teenage mothers are dependent it gets extremely confusing and even though the policy is quite clear that mm. um a young mother who has an id document can claim a grant on behalf of their child, even though their own mother claims it for them. Mm. At individual SASA offices, it can get very confusing. Yeah. And and then for the applicants themselves, um, it gets very confusing. But and then in this country, a huge administrative barrier. I wrote about it, you know, many years ago, and it's still the case now. The biggest and now COVID has made that worse. Mm-hmm. Not having a birth certificate. And yet to have a birth certificate, the mother needs to have an identity document. And then Mm -hmm. in this country where black people only got identity documents from after 1994, Mm. you know, that that history, Mm. um, that legacy of people not being identified continues. Mm. So for Mm. people who are not, because to register, to get an identity document, then if you've not had it before, people have had to use, you know, you had you had a witness or a couple of them, and then the, the chief, if you live in rural areas, needs to agree that you are really the person that you say you are. It's extremely oh, complicated. Mm. 
Yeah. And yeah. then and then for some where the say the mother, you know, the, the even the matriarch never registered. It means her own children who are now adults would not have registered. registered. And then their and own can't children. register their own children. And it continues oh forevermore. So these stories that I, I I'm always just amazed. And then mm -hmm. names that change and then if you factor in traditional ways of mm -hmm. of naming and of assigning names like surnames if you're born in marriage mm -hmm. or out of it gets extremely complicated so that's still a huge barrier on in, in terms of policy we have something that's called um uh, uh, um it's not intermittent it's um like a, a temporary grant for the csg that you can get if you have issues with documentation you can get in the okay. meantime you get it for three months and then after three months if it stops I mean, it will stop after three months if your issue is still not re resolved, then you can get uh, it renewed for another three months. But it's amazing how few people know of this. Mm. Um, I and then this is the how, first I'm hearing of this. <laughs> and then how few administrators yeah. of the grant, how few people at SASA offices, agents will, will mm. tell the person that- Will oh, volunteer the information. These, yeah. Well, I mean, mm. some will not even go to SASA because if you don't have a, a mm. document, you you can't even go. They'll be stuck at home mm. affairs. And that's the mm. other problem is that we still don't have a good, strong, synergistic, collaborative integrated. relationship integrated yes. between these yeah. departments. So a person is Absolutely. stuck at, at, at home affairs. They don't know that they can go to SASA and say, mm. I have this problem, but I know that there's this temporary grant that I can access in the meantime. So in, mm. on paper, as with most policies in this country, actually there shouldn't be anyone who's not getting a child support grant for mm -hmm. any reason, because there's, there's still the temporary child support grant, which is the same value of the grant that they should mm -hmm. get until they're sorted out, but it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. hmm. And I mean, it speaks to issues of like personhood, like recognizing a person's legitimacy, their humanity, yeah. Um, yeah. even in a situation where that person is looking for assistance, doesn't make them less human. Yeah. Um, I want to to start closing on that note because I think this this has been a difficult module. I want to acknowledge that it's a difficult one. Um, the state of motherhood in South Africa is not where we want it to be. Mothers are in precarious, dire positions more often than they're not. Um, we knew this going in, um, and 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 what we wanted to do was to just equip this community with the facts and the numbers. Um, because again, you know, we are often in conversations where, you know, people are like, well, people just want the grant because they want this and that. And it's it's very useful to be able to say, um, actually the uptake is this and the gap is this and it's quite big. Um, and explaining that just, just it's useful to have this information to, I guess, to push back in some of those conversations mm -hmm. we find ourselves in. And it is also, I think it's also useful because in some of the spaces we are in, definitely embrace, we find ourselves as the holders of a lot of information and we have to translate public information mm -hmm. for people because it's it's written in a in a way that isn't yeah. um, legible. I always use the, my favorite example to use is the road to health booklet, which has that um, immunization schedule. Mm -hmm. I have an MA. I have no idea what all of those <laughs> organizations means. How hard is it for them to add a column that just explains mm -hmm. what the jabs and the drops and the whatever are for? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so we are we are often doing that in our work. Mm -hmm. And I think what we wanted to do for the community is to, to kind of peek behind kind of the broad strokes um, and to give people a sense of the numbers. I know this has been a difficult module. I know it has. But stick with us. <laughs> stick with us. We are we are going into a place where we're kind of going behind the numbers to get to people's stories and people's humanity, and and figuring out what our role is is in recognizing people's humanity, because mm -hmm. um, that's what you know. I feel like that's what Embrace does does very well. Definitely for me as a member of the movement, um, is to be seen and heard as a person, as a, as a <laughs> mother, as a person, as a mother person, you know, mm -hmm. um, and to not have, you know, society tends to kind of diminish your personhood, especially once you become a woman and you're a mother and you're this, the person mm -hmm. in that is lost. Um, so 
So thank you to the community for sticking with us. Um, and thank you so much, Wanga, for coming and telling us, um, opening up a little bit of your research um, mm -hmm. that, that you do with such grace. <laughs> and, and some of these painful stories that you hold, I know it, it can't be easy to, to walk within in your head and in your heart. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I'm grateful if, if anyone has to, I'm grateful that it's you. Um, and you. yeah, we hope you're going to stick around as well with us um, as we kind of delve more, more deeply into what we can actually, what we can do coming out of this community. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rumbi. Thank you to the audience. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for, for your patience with us. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, and we, I have a two-year-old to put to bed and you have a five-year-old to put to bed. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's going to be it for tonight. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. Bye.